If you were trapped in a rundown house with no way to escape and only two hours to live, what would you do? These unsuspecting criminals are about to end up the next victims in a madman's death game, and they're going to have to do whatever it takes if they want to make it out alive. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the return of Jigsaw in Saw 2. <laughs> This detective is going to learn the hard way what happens when you try to hide from the mistakes of your past. Suddenly waking up after being knocked unconscious, this guy, Michael, finds himself locked in a dingy room with nothing but some bright lights, a TV, and a mirror around him. Looking at his reflection, he realizes that his left eye seems badly damaged, but what's even more horrifying is that his head is trapped inside of a steel, mask-like contraption filled with giant metal spikes. Just then, the TV turns on, and Billy the Jigsaw Puppet appears on the screen, telling Michael that he wants to play a game. Because the man makes his living spying on others, Jigsaw tells him that he'll have to sacrifice the part of his body that he relies on the most if he wants to survive. The death mask is on a timer, and if he doesn't find the key in time, then it will snap shut, brutally killing him. After showing Michael footage of him on an operating table to prove that the key is really hidden inside of his body, he gives him one final hint, flashing x-rays of the key behind his eyeball and telling him that it's right before his eyes. Terrified, Michael lunges for a toolbox across the room, accidentally pulling a pin out of the trap and activating the timer. Inside, he finds a surgeon's scalpel and starts psyching himself up to perform the operation. Although he comes close to doing it, in the end, he's too afraid, tossing the blade across the room and falling to his knees as he screams out for help. That's when the timer runs out and the trap snaps shut, killing him. That makes one victim down, with nine more to go. Okay, talk about a splitting headache. This is an absolute nightmare scenario, but what could Michael here have done differently if he wanted to survive? The first step with any jigsaw trap is to carefully observe your surroundings. Looking around the room, we can see that the wire to activate the trap is attached to a small pulley on the wall nearby. Although he was definitely in a bad position, the danger didn't become immediate until he went for the toolbox, pulling on the wire and causing the timer to start counting down. This means that technically, as long as he avoided pulling out the pin, he'd have about three days to think of what to do next, or even just sit there and hope that someone would eventually come to help before he eventually started to die from dehydration. Now, instead of pulling away from the wall, what Michael actually needed to do here was go towards it and see if he could find some way to unhook or damage the pulley without ever activating the trap at all. He could search around the room for any improvised tools, like a loose pipe to break it, or a thin piece of metal to pry it off of the wall, just as long as he made sure to stay within a safe radius that didn't trigger the timer. It also might have been worth trying to stop the mask from working the way that Jigsaw had intended altogether, either by finding some way to damage the padlocks, or leather straps that are holding it onto his body, or by jamming something into the mechanism to prevent it from snapping shut like a pipe, or parts of the chair that he was first sitting on. Of course, once the trap was activated, with so little time left and guaranteed death waiting for him if he failed, the safest bet of all would have been to just complete the challenge and cut out his eye to get the key. It's going to be the hardest thing that he's ever done. But when the other option is getting his head crushed in a death mask, he has to be willing to make the sacrifice to get out alive. If he was lucky enough to survive, then he'd quickly want to find something to pack the hole and stop the bleeding, and get some medical attention as soon as possible, so that the wound wouldn't become infected. Good luck getting it done in time, though. With only one minute on the clock, he's got less time to do all of that than you're supposed to just spend brushing your teeth in the morning. So even if he actually had the stomach to do what needed to be done, the odds of surviving this one are unfortunately slim to none. Later, Detective Eric Matthews goes to pick up his son, Daniel, who's in trouble for attempting to steal from an electronics store. Eric warns him that they're going to press charges and starts giving his son a hard time for acting out. Upset, the kid says that he'd rather go stay with his mom instead, so the detective shouts at him to just leave if that's what he wants. The next day, Eric gets a call from his sergeant asking him to come down and check out the crime scene of Michael's death. 
There, he meets with fellow investigator Detective Allison Carey, who tells him that the victim was identified as one of Eric's informants, but that they need him to confirm his identity. Although the man's face is completely destroyed, Eric is able to identify him from the tattoo on his ankle and notices a puzzle piece cut out of his shoulder, proving that he must have been one of Jigsaw's victims. Allison asks him if he can think of anyone who might be a suspect, adding that whoever it was must be very intelligent based on the comp complicated design of the trap. Unsure, he's just about to leave the room when she calls his attention to one final clue. On the ceiling above them, the killer left him a personal message. Look closer, Detective Matthews. That night, Eric has nightmares about the crime scene and suddenly remembers noticing an important detail about the mask. The metal used to make it was manufactured at a nearby industrial plant called Wilson Steel. After calling down to the station, Eric and Allison quickly join up with a SWAT team and storm the building. The office Officers make their way inside, eventually coming to a staircase that's enclosed in a suspicious-looking metal cage. Cutting open the lock, they cautiously start moving up to the next floor, when suddenly, the lead officer activates a pressure plate trap, causing the puppet to come riding up on his tiny bike as a distraction. Just then, the door behind them slams shut, and when the officer presses forward, placing more of his weight on the stair, the next step shoots towards him and breaks his legs, sending him crashing into the two men behind him, who then fall back and are electrocuted by a current that's running through the cage. Pulling the men to safety, the rest of the team storms inside where they find Jigsaw's workshop, and sitting in a wheelchair at the end of the room is a sick-looking old man, John Kramer, the Jigsaw killer himself. The officers put the man in restraints and arrest him without incident, but just when Eric is about to leave, John tells him that he shouldn't go until he investigates a cage on the other side of the room. Searching inside, Eric pulls back a blanket and finds a set of screens that show a group of hostages, suddenly realizing that one of them is his son, Daniel. Eric rushes back over to John, demanding to know what he's doing with his son. That's when John reveals that the boy only has two hours to live before a poisonous gas that's pumping through the house slowly kills him. Eric wants to know where he is, but John cryptically responds that he's in a safe place. Furious, Eric goes back over to the monitors and borrows Allison's phone to call his son, only to hear Jigsaw on the kid's voicemail. Another officer notices a digital clock counting down the minutes that the victims have left to live, and calls for the bomb squad as Eric watches Daniel through the screen, trying to figure out a way to save save him. Okay, it looks like this just got personal for Detective Matthews here. He's only got two hours to save his son's life, but has no idea where the boy even really is, so where should he start? One thing that we know about Jigsaw is that he likes for a part of his hints to be taken literally. For example, like when he told Michael that the key was right before his eyes. The detectives have the tape from Michael's death game, so if they're paying attention, then they should be aware of this trick. Knowing this, because he said that Daniel was in a safe place, I'd start by searching any place nearby that might have a safe to see if I could find the kid or some clues to his location. This could be some place like a bank or even somewhere that Eric has known criminals to use as a safe house during his police work. When they first walked in, there was actually a safe sitting right next to Jigsaw there. And it might seem too obvious, but if it were me, then that would have been the first place that I'd check. Besides that clue, they also have the security camera footage to go off of, but they might want to make sure that it's actually live first before taking it too seriously. I'd start by following the cables to see what the monitors were plugged into, and checking to see if there's anything about the setup that's suspicious in any way, since the worst thing to do right now would be to accidentally waste time focusing on a distraction. Finally, I'd want to check around Jigsaw's office for any more clues that could help me out. Remember, this is all a game to him, and the reality is that Jigsaw's too meticulous to make a convenient mistake, like leaving the location of his hideout right there on the death mask. The only reason that Eric figured out where to find him is because Jigsaw wanted him to. So there's a very good chance that there are more clues hidden around the building that could lead him to his son. At this point, Eric's best, and really his only option, is to keep playing along with the game 
and pay very careful attention to every detail of what the man says. Meanwhile, in the dilapidated house, the captives start to regain consciousness and begin trying to figure out what's happening. They quickly find out that the room is sealed with a huge metal door, and someone seems to be watching them through a system of closed circuit cameras. Horrified, they realize that they've all been kidnapped and brought here for some unknown reason, and now their only option is to find a way to escape. Pressing her head against the door, this woman Addison tells the others that she can hear a strange ticking sound. Just then, another hostage named Amanda finally wakes up and immediately starts freaking out worse than anyone else. As Amanda tears the room apart, she eventually locates a few loose bricks along one of the walls and breaks them away until she finds a tape player. This guy Jonas comes to ask her what it is and she explains that everything they need to know will be on the tape. After hitting play, everyone gathers around and listens as Jigsaw lays out the details of the trap. In three hours, the door to the house will open, setting them free, the only problem being that they have just two hours to live. There's a deadly nerve gas pumping through the building that they've been breathing in since they arrived, and the only way for any of them to survive is to find the antidote. Several syringes of the cure are hidden around the house, including one in the safe right in front of them. To open the lock, they'll have to figure out the combination, and Jigsaw gives them two hints. The numbers are in the back of their minds, and the clue for their order can be found just over the rainbow. Also, each of them has something in common that can help them better understand exactly why they've been chosen. And Jigsaw tells them to look carefully, because for this clue, X marks the spot. Grabbing a piece of paper from a pile of rubble, this ex-convict Xavier discovers a small key, along with a note that straight up says do not try using it on the door. Amanda warns him to listen to what the note says, but he's determined to try it anyway. This guy Gus here decides to look through the peephole. As soon as Xavier turns the key, he accidentally activates a revolver trap that fires straight into Gus's eye, killing him instantly. That makes two victims down, with eight more to go. As everyone begins to panic, Jonas grabs Amanda and demands that she tells them what she knows, which is exactly when she reveals that they've all been captured by Jigsaw. She knows this because she has survived one of his games before and says that they can all make it out as long as they're careful and follow the rules. Okay, these people need to act fast. It's a scary thought, but if Jigsaw trapped you in an escape room with deadly consequences, do you think that you'd survive? These contestants have all been poisoned, and they only have two hours left to live. They need to find a way out, or quickly get their hands on some of the antidote before it's too late. Since there's only one dose of the cure here, and it's locked in a safe, their biggest priority should be getting out. The only door is made of impenetrable steel, so while some of them search for a key or combination, the others need to look for weak points, like the windows or thin sections of the walls. Although the door is too tough to get through by force, they could try creating their own exit using any improvised tools that they find, which would get them into the rest of the house and open up more options to escape. They'll still have a long way to go, but if they take their time and follow the rules, then they just might stand a chance at survival. Amanda here seems to know what's going on better than anyone else, which is why if it were me, I'd be teaming up with her and carefully listening to her advice. She says that the most important thing is to play along with the game and follow the rules, so that's exactly what the others need to do. Remember, Jigsaw's clues almost always have a literal element to them. The first clue that he gave was that the numbers to the safe are in the back of their minds. The numbers are in the back of your mind. So, as gross as it is, they should use the dead guy as an opportunity to check to see if he meant that literally. The second clue was that the order for the numbers is hidden over the rainbow. While it's exactly hard to put together exactly what he means by that right now, the good news is that since they're stuck in this one room, they have a very limited area to work with. The answer must be in there somewhere, so they should work together to search the place up and down for anything that resembles a rainbow. Hopefully they'll end up finding something that will help them piece together the situation. They've all been pretty unlucky so far, but if there's one thing that they have going for them, it's that they're trapped in a room that has windows. The reinforcements on them look strong, but not impossible to get through. So while they're searching for a way out, at least a few of them should attack the windows to see if they can make any progress. 
Even if they can't create a hole big enough for a person to fit through, they might be able to expose a section of the glass and then use one of the loose bricks that are laying around to shatter it, creating some ventilation and circulating the air, which should, at the very least, dilute the strength of the gas and help them live a few minutes longer. Back at the factory, Eric goes back over to John for more information and the man explains that all he wants is a little bit of the detective's time. He wants to speak with him in private, promising that if he agrees then he'll see his son again. Instead, the detective threatens to strong arm the answers out of him, which is when John reveals that he's been diagnosed with terminal cancer, so there's nothing that Eric can do to put him in any more pain than he's already experiencing. Eric and the other officers discuss their options, and although the SWAT team leader thinks that they should take the old school approach, Allison finally convinces him to at least try speaking to John, if only to buy them a little more time. The hostages start tearing the room apart, looking for any antidote, syringes, or clues, when suddenly the door to the room creaks open, and they realize that it was on a timer all along. Grabbing a broomstick, Xavier carefully pulls open the door the rest of the way before taking the key and stepping out into the hallway. After finding a spiked baseball bat, he tells the others that he's taking matters into his own hands to find some antidote and a way out. In the house's front room, they find a door labeled Exit. Xavier crouches down off to the side and carefully tries the key, but it doesn't fit, so he throws it to the ground in frustration, and Jonas decides to pick it up. Meanwhile, Eric tells the others to clear the room and sits down with John to talk, which is when he reveals that he wants to play a game. The only rule is that Eric needs to stay and listen to what John has to say. If he succeeds, then he'll find his son in a safe and secure state. Back at the house, Xavier tries breaking through the wooden door with his bat, only to discover that the other side is reinforced with a heavy metal shutter. With the pressure of the situation building, the group begins to turn on each other, but Jonas manages to calm them down, mentioning that the tape said that they all have something in common, and saying that they should try to figure out what that is. Before he can finish his train of thought, this girl Laura finds an unlocked door leading down into the basement, and they decide to check it out. Xavier leads them in, with everyone else following closely behind. They see what looks like a person wearing a hood slumped over in a wheelchair and facing the corner. Xavier raises his bat, ready for a fight, but when Jonas pulls their head back, they realize that the person is already dead, and a knife pinning a note labeled Obi to their chest. Just then, one of the hostages who hasn't spoken yet says that the note must be for him. Inside, they find another cassette tape, and when they turn it on, Jigsaw tells Obi that he wants to play a game. According to the killer, there are two syringes of the antidote inside of the giant oven at the center of the room. That's when Jigsaw reveals that Obi helped him kidnap the others, saying that the first syringe is a gift for his work, and that it's up to him who gets the second. The only catch is that one of them will come with a price. And he adds one final hint, saying that once you're in hell, only the devil can help you out. Suddenly, Laura has a flashback, remembering that it was Obi who knocked her out and brought her there. He claims that he had no choice, but the others are completely furious at him for what he's done. With Xavier here grabbing the knife from the dead body and ordering Obi to go in the oven and get the syringes, or else he'll kill him on the spot. Cornered, he agrees to give it a try, on the condition that he gets to keep one of the needles for himself if he survives. Crawling headfirst into the oven, Obi spots the two syringes dangling on the other side and reaches out, safely pulling the first one down. After flipping over to get a better angle, he pulls down on the second syringe, but that's when the oven door slams shut, trapping him inside. Suddenly, the inside bursts into flames, and Obi quickly finds himself seconds away from burning to death. The others start trying to open the door while Obi desperately attempts to break out through a small window at the other end, but it's locked, and the handle is too hot for anyone to get a strong enough grip. Looking up, he sees a small valve with a drawing of the devil pointing towards it and the word twist, but the fire is already too much for him to reach. Jonas tries to use his jacket to get the door open, but it doesn't work, leaving the window as his only chance to escape. 
Xavier grabs the spiked bat and finally manages to shatter the glass, but it's too late, and Obi manages to make it halfway through before burning to death just inches from safety, the syringes melting in the fire along with him. That makes three victims down, with seven more to go. While the others start to panic, Amanda here calmly grabs a shovel and quietly heads back upstairs. Okay. Obi here just got roasted, and he's not the only one that's feeling the heat. By now, they should all be well aware that every one of Jigsaw's puzzles is hiding some sort of deadly twist. So before trying to find a solution, the most important thing is to carefully think the challenge through. Instead of climbing straight into the death trap, Obi should have started by taking a careful look around and inside of the device. If he'd taken a minute to think about what he was getting himself into, then he might have figured out that it was some sort of oven. Logically, it's going to need gas to start a flame. So the first thing to try would be finding a way to turn off the gas from the outside. By taking a moment to peek in first, Obi would have noticed the needles dangling on the opposite end, meaning that he'd have to be completely inside to reach them. He'd also see the valve that says twist, the small window at the other side, and possibly anything suspicious about the door that he'd have to crawl through. Once he'd thoroughly checked the device out, that's when it would be time to take some action. For starters, I'd be breaking the glass window to see if I could reach through it and grab the needles from the other end without ever having to put my whole body inside of the trap or possibly use whatever I could to find in the room to create an improvised tool to pull the needles out that way. If that didn't work, and he had no other choice but to go in, then he could have listened to Jigsaw's hint Only the devil can help you out. and tried turning the valve before reaching for the needles, which would hopefully have shut off the gas and stopped him from being burned alive. Also, it'd be smart to find something in the room that he could use to block the door from shutting and have the others do their best to hold it open for a little extra insurance. At the very end, when he knew that he wasn't getting out, he could have at least still passed the two syringes through, which would have saved two lives and had given him the chance to die a hero. Instead, he panicked and let them both melt. So maybe this is just what he deserved after all. Back at the factory, John explains how finding out about his illness was the moment that he truly began to appreciate being alive. He'd tried to crash his car as a way to end his suffering. He ended up surviving the accident and from that point on, decided to start testing others to teach them the value of life. Meanwhile, Laura begins to pass out as the nerve agent's hold on her becomes stronger, with Daniel doing his best to keep her awake and fighting. While Amanda searches around the room for any clues, Daniel asks her why she was chosen the first time, and she explains that it was because she was hooked on illegal substances. Although she managed to survive, she quickly fell back into bad habits, and Jigsaw must have decided that she hadn't truly learned her lesson. Although she was arrested for possession, insinuating that the officer who arrested her falsified the evidence to get a conviction. Trying to relate, Daniel almost admits that his father is a detective, but realizing that the others finding this out could put him in danger, he catches himself before he reveals too much. Just then, Jonas shows up and tells them that they found an unlocked door upstairs. Forcing it open, Xavier accidentally trips a wire, activating a digital clock that's built into a heavy metal door. The others follow him in, and while they're searching around, Jonas finds a note with Xavier's name on it playing the tape. They listen as Jigsaw explains that the key to the door is buried somewhere in a pit of used needles in the center of the room. And if they don't find it before the timer runs out, then the door will be locked forever. With only two minutes remaining, Xavier panics and grabs Amanda, tossing her into the pit instead and shouting at her to find the key. Screaming in pain, she desperately digs through the pile while the needles stab her all over her body. Finally, she finds the key and throws it up to Xavier. Just as he goes for the keyhole, the timer runs out and the lock slams shut. Xavier storms out of the room, saying that he's done working with the group and is going to find a way out for himself. Okay, this guy Xavier just exposed himself as being the most dangerous one in the group, and I think that it might be time to vote him off the island if you know what I mean. Because if anyone's going to be using people as meat shields, 
It's gonna be me, right from the beginning. He messed up their chances here by rushing into the room without carefully observing his surroundings. If he had just looked up, then he would have seen that the door was rigged with a wire. From there, the next thing to do would be to see if he could have reached up and deactivated the trap, or sent one of the smaller members of the group like Daniel or Laura inside to try to unscrew the little eye hook that's holding it all together without tripping the wire and activating the countdown for the lock on the other door. If they could get inside without triggering the hammer, then they'd have all the time that they needed to come up with a careful solution to find the key. Since nobody is going to want to dig around in a pit full of needles without some protection, they could have used the thick bed sheets that were originally covering up the hole to wrap around one person's legs and arms, and then lower them down slowly to avoid being jabbed. There's also some furniture and that creepy old stroller in the room which they could have used as tools to safely dig around. Once the countdown began, with so many needles to search through, and so little time to do it, there was pretty much no chance that they'd find the key in time anyway. Still, this doesn't mean that they couldn't try making their own door. Even with the exit locked, they should use whatever tools that they have, like the spiked bat, shovel from the basement, and anything else that they can find to attack the walls, windows, floors, or even the ceiling. Anywhere that might be weak enough for them to punch through and create their own path forward. Meanwhile, the detectives start to worry that time is running out and try to come up with a plan for what to do next. That's when Allison suggests that they threaten to destroy the evidence of John's work, thereby taking away the notoriety and chance to live on through his legacy that he seems to be after. Going back over to John, Eric starts tearing up the evidence right in front of him, but John tells him that it really doesn't matter because doing this won't save his son. Just then, John reveals that he has one more trick up his sleeve telling the detective to search one of the drawers in the monitor room to see what he's talking about. Inside, the detectives find a folder full of the arrest records for each of the hostages in the house, revealing that Eric was the arresting officer in each case, and planted false evidence to get all of them convicted. Now, it's even more important for him to act fast, because if the others were to find out that Daniel is his son, then they might kill him before the nerve gas ever has a chance. Xavier makes his way back up to the first room with the safe, accidentally moving the coat that they were using to cover up Gus's body. That's when he remembers that, according to Jigsaw, the combination is in the back of their minds, and pulls down the man's collar, revealing the number two. Jonas steps in the room, starting to vomit up blood, and tells Xavier that they should work together, but he says that he's going to finish this on his own. Standing up, he pulls out a knife and orders Jonas to turn around. Jonas decides that it's time to fight back, and in the struggle, they both fall to the floor, with Jonas kicking Xavier hard in the face. Although he manages to get the upper hand, the nerve agent starts to take full effect. Xavier rushes for the spiked bat, swinging it into the back of Jonas's skull. He staggers forward and collapses to the floor, dead. That makes four victims down, with six more to go. Xavier finds the number 16 tattooed on the back of his neck. As the others continue searching the house, Laura collapses from the exposure to the gas. But from her position on the floor, she notices a picture frame hung up on the wall with the glass broken in the shape of an X, saying that this must be the X marks the spot. Turning the picture around, Addison finds a hidden photo of Eric and Daniel together and realizes that the boy's father is the officer who put them all away. Just then, Laura starts to violently convulse until she finally dies in Amanda's arms. That makes five victims down with five more to go. No longer able to trust anyone, Addison decides to go off on her own, leaving Daniel and Amanda alone in the hall Hallway, which is when they hear Xavier searching for them somewhere else in the house. While Xavier goes down into the basement and finds the number 11 written on Obi, Amanda goes back into the safe room and discovers Jonas's dead body, realizing that Xavier must have been his killer. Upstairs, he finds Laura's body next, this time seeing that her number was 8, before discovering the photo of Daniel and his dad. As Amanda grabs the kid and they try to escape, they nearly end up crashing right into Xavier and run for their lives as he chases after them with the knife. No longer able to sit back and watch as his son is in danger, Eric grabs his weapons and attacks John, throwing him around the room and demanding to know what he's done with the kid. John only taunts him that it won't be long until his son is dead, so Eric breaks one of the man's fingers before slamming him to the ground and threatening to shoot him if he doesn't give in. 
Finally, John agrees to take him to the house, on the sole condition that nobody else is allowed to follow. Before the others even have a chance to notice, Eric loads John into the van and speeds off towards the house. The officers get a lock on the signal for the source of the camera feed, and the SWAT team rushes to the location. Addison here wanders into an unlocked room, where she finds a syringe of antidote placed inside of a clear glass box above her head. There's another envelope with a cassette tape, but she throws it away and immediately sticks her arm into the box. Grabbing the syringe, she tries to lift it out, but only ends up pulling it apart. Sticking her other arm in, she realizes that the holes are covered up with sharp, angled metal, leaving her trapped with no way to escape. Xavier hears her screaming for help, but instead of trying to set her free, he only looks at the number 9 on the back of her neck before leaving her there to die. That makes 6 victims down, with 4 more to go. Okay. This one was just embarrassing. Addison here didn't even try listening to the tape, and if there's one thing that she should have learned by now, it's that you always listen to the tape. I get that she's in a hurry, but really, how long could it have taken to go back, find Jonas, and get the tape player? That way, she would have at least had a hint about what she was up against. As with all of these tests, the thing to do here is to carefully observe the trap first, and in this case, think outside of the box, literally. Before just sticking her hands in there, she should have tried breaking the cage in some way first, either by shattering the glass or by busting the whole pane right out of the frame if it turned out to be shatterproof. There seems to be plenty of thick pieces of wood right here in the corner of the room that look like they'd be great for doing some smashing. If that didn't work, then she could have taken one of those same boards and pushed it through the hole first, opening up the trap and allowing her to safely slip her hand inside to carefully grab the syringe without getting cut. As Amanda and Daniel take cover in the safe room, Xavier shows up and starts trying to break his way inside. While Daniel holds him off, Amanda grabs the spiked bat and slams it into the floor floorboards, using it as a bar to jam the door shut. Looking back towards the safe, she realizes from the pool of Jonas's blood that there's a trap door hidden underneath it, and calls Daniel over to help her push it clear. Although they managed to move the safe, they end up finding out that the door is locked, which is when Daniel remembers that Jonas should still have the key in his pocket. Luckily, it works, and they slip down through the door just as Xavier finally breaks in. Eric arrives outside of the building, and John gives him a key, saying that he'll need it to get in. Searching the house, he finds the photo of him and Daniel. While he sweeps the upper floors, the SWAT team busts in through the front door, but Allison points out that she can't see any of them on the cameras. That's when they find a room full of monitors, and realize that not only were the cameras never live, but Jigsaw led the SWAT team to an entirely different house. Now running for their lives, Amanda and Daniel end up walking straight into the bathroom where Jigsaw played his very first game, with the bloody hacksaw lying on the floor. Xavier finally catches up with them, and finds Daniel passed out with Amanda looking like she's not doing much better. He tells them that all he wants is the number on the back of their necks but she points out that he still doesn't know his own, and he won't be able to get it if she doesn't tell him. Xavier tries looking in a nearby mirror, but it's too dirty, so he realizes that he only has one choice left. He slices the chunk of skin from the back of his neck, and moving towards the others to finally finish the job, Daniel suddenly jumps up and slashing his throat with the hacksaw. That makes seven victims down, with three more to go. Following their trail, Eric comes to the bathroom and finds Xavier's dead body, but Amanda and his son are nowhere in sight. That's when he sees what looks like a body laying in a bathtub, but when he leans in to investigate, the person springs towards him and jabs a syringe into his leg. Back at the warehouse, the death timer runs out, and a safe on the other side of the room swings open, revealing Daniel trapped inside but still alive. If Eric listened to John, then he would have found his son safe and sound, but now he's about to end up the most recent victim in the next of Jigsaw's games. Okay. Jigsaw just played this guy here like a fiddle. This whole time he thought that he was the one in control, but I think by now it's safe to say, Eric, you f***ed up. They say that what goes around comes around, and boy, are you about to learn that the hard way. It wasn't even Jigsaw himself who started your downward spiral, although it looks like he's about to finish it. No, the hard truth is that the only person you have to blame for the position that you're in right now is yourself. You might have thought 
that you could get away with falsifying evidence to get convictions, but a badge can't protect you from karma forever. The rules were simple. All that you needed to do was listen to what Jigsaw had to say, and you would have found your son safe and sound just like he promised. Instead, you let your hot-headed ways take over once again, and sure enough, you ended up walking right into his trap. I guess this is what you get for locking up so many innocent people. And now, it's your turn to find out what it's like to be on the other side of the bars. If Daniel wasn't disappointed with you enough already, then he sure is going to be now. Because if this is how you planned on trying to save him, then he never would have had a chance. When all that you needed to do was go two hours without beating up an old man and you still somehow managed to blow it, Eric, you f***ed up. Eric wakes up on the bathroom floor, finding a tape player lying there on the ground. He hears Amanda's voice talking to him, saying how she wants revenge for how he ruined her life. After surviving Jigsaw's game the first time around, she decided to take him on as a new mentor and promised to carry on his legacy after his death. She leaves Eric trapped alone in the darkness, while John smiles from his place out in the van. That makes eight victims down, with one survivor and a new jigsaw on the loose. And now, Eric's real game can finally begin. But what would you do? If you found out that Jigsaw had captured your son and thrown him into another one of his house of deadly games, would you listen to Jigsaw and just follow the rules in hopes that you'll see your son again or take matters into your own hands like the detective? If Jigsaw had my son, I'd, I'd know what I would do, but you know, you know, I kind of want to see him again. So let us know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this. Also, be sure to check out The Kill Plan, the new show now streaming on the channel.